Okay, good afternoon, folks. Uh, we're going to start our um, afternoon uh, session right now. So if you could uh, come on in, take your seats. We'll go ahead and get, uh, we'll, hope, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, my name is Norman Spaulding. I'm on the faculty of the law school here. I teach uh, the required professional responsibility class. I write in professional ethics and the law of lawyering and the history of the American legal profession. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. I want to thank uh, Roland Vogel for the invitation. This is one of my favorite events every uh, year and uh, it's just been a, a real pleasure to uh, learn more about uh, the panelists who are presenting uh, uh, today and, uh, and, and chatbots in general. Um, I'm going to make a couple of introductory remarks and then we're going to have each of the panelists actually demonstrate their uh, technology. Uh, so Joshua Browder, who's a Stanford student, uh, will present the um, chatbot, uh, uh, do, not, is it, do Not Pay is the one you're going to, yeah, great. And then uh, Kevin uh, Yu, is, who's from uh, Hilbert Technology, and then we've got two people from uh, VisaBot, uh, Artem Goldman and Andre Zinoviev. And then uh, Joshua Lennon and I, Joshua's from Clio, and I will uh, split getting the discussion going. Joshua will uh, lead off by raising some examples and problems for the, uh, for the panelists. So just by way of, uh, of introduction, um, uh, this technology uh, rests at the center. I'm a, a legal historian and, and historian of the legal profession in addition to teaching the law of learning. You're all futurists, so you can tune out if you want to stay in futurist mode for the next three moments to what I'm going to say about the history that brings us to where we are uh, today. This technology rests, in my view, at the intersection of two deep trajectories in the practice and history of the law. The first is um, the, the um, arguments uh, that have systematically been made since the founding of the Republic for greater access to legal services. It was a deep Jacksonian democratic populist movement for uh, greater access to law. One feature of that movement for access to law was the elimination in more than a dozen states of requirements for entry to practice for law. Elimination of bar requirements, elimination, there wasn't law school at the time, there was apprenticeship, elimination of all of those standards on the argument that anyone who could exercise natural reason had a right to be a lawyer. And it was democratic populists who believed in access to law who made that claim and moved their legislatures to eliminate those restrictions. There was a response by the bar, you uh, might expect, I won't belabor you with it um, uh, today, but it's important to recognize that the argument that in a democratic society knowledge of what the law is is fundamental to the legitimacy and functioning of that society predates all of us and all of the work that, uh, that, uh, that those of, of you who are engaged in trying to figure out how to use artificial intelligence and software to improve access to law are currently doing. The second long-term trend I'll just say a little bit more about is the relationship between the epistemology of law, how we know what the law is, and the technological tools that we use to ascertain the law. They've always been tightly connected, running all the way back to the very foundations of legal practice in common law regimes. Indeed, for most of the history of common law regimes, uh, societies have found it difficult to ascertain what the law is. And the rise of lawyers you may think that today the problem is lawyers are getting in the way in some instances of developing technology for access to law, but the rise of the legal procession, profession rests on the development by lawyers of technology, of tools for improving our knowledge of what the law is. You can take this all the way back to the foundation of the legal profession in the development of plea roles. So judges would request that pleas be entered and lawyers helped formalize that process by reducing them to writing. It was lawyers who were actually creating documents that could be the basis of legal decision making and then recording what those documents were. Through the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and the development of treatises, which were digests of the law. And for most of the history of the common law, uh, common law decisions weren't published opinions. They were issued orally from the bench. And it was lawyers who went to the trouble of creating reports of what the law were by sitting in court and transcribing what those decisions were, by developing law magazines to disseminate information, to publish information about what decisions had been made, and then turning back to treatises and revise them so that the public could get better information and so that our lawyers could get better information about what the law, um, uh, what the law was. So those uh, reductions of information costs and in ascertaining what the law is for much of the history of the common law have come from lawyers by reducing, by developing technology for systematizing, uh, disseminating, typically by publication, legal information. Uh, in the late 19th century, a new technological development has developed, the indexing and key systems developed by Westlaw and Lexis. And it's an interesting thing about this from an epistemological perspective. Most lawyers 
at the time were actually quite anxious about this. They were glad to have it, an index where you could look up a particular legal topic and find every case in every jurisdiction that had decided that specific issue because the, the Westlaw system had gone through and indexed and keyed legal decision making according to issues that were decided. But if you read the diaries and correspondence of lawyers at the time, they were incredibly anxious about this. Their argument was that there's too much law. I can't be made responsible for knowing all of this law. Now that it's all published, it's all in reporters, and now that an index can show me where to find every single case that stands for a particular proposition, I'm now professionally responsible for reading all of these damn things. Right? I'm responsible to know, and there's too much law to know. Right? Today, as um, artificial intelligence is being uh, combined with other technologies and development of code to disseminate legal information, we have a different kind of anxiety, a different kind of problem regarding the epistemology of what the law is, how to ascertain what the law is, a question about whether that legal information that's being produced through code and in some instances through fully automated uh, uh, software technology whether that information about the legal process that's being disseminated is in a proper sense law, right? Then there's one version of this that comes up every time I've ever done a codex panel, whether it is law in the sense that it's legal advice and therefore subject to the prohibition on unauthorized practice of law, whether it is law in the sense that uh, a client or customer who relies on it can sue you for malpractice. But there is, I think, another deeper question about whether this information is law, whether it is law in the sense that as large numbers of people act on the basis of that information being provided, it becomes, in a sense, law in the ordinary sense that we think of, in the sort of base level sense that sociologists and some lawyers think of law. Any rule that, to which people conform their behavior. Right? Any kind of information that shapes in a systematic way the decision making that people engage in. The point is that technology, the technological means for ascertaining what the law is and providing public access to it affect what we understand the law to be. And so as you see the presentations today, I'll hope you think, I'll, I'll, I hope you'll think that you'll keep that question in mind and, uh, and hopefully we can open up a broader discussion about it after the presentations. So without further ado, uh, Joshua Browder. <laughs> So good morning, good afternoon everyone. My name is Josh and I'm going to speak about my chatbot lawyer, the future of the legal profession and how chatbots can improve access to justice. So I'm speaking on this topic almost by accident. At the age of 18, I was a really terrible driver and began to receive a large number of parking tickets. After about the fourth ticket, my parents told me, you're on your own, you have to pay for your own fines. And so out of necessity, because I couldn't afford a lawyer or to pay the fees, I had to figure out other ways to get those tickets dismissed. <coughs> I trawled through hundreds of pages of obscure government documents looking for the top reasons why parking tickets in the UK should be cancelled. It wasn't long before I became the parking ticket guru of my local area and all my family and friends were asking for my help. But it quickly became obvious that I, ha I was copying and pasting appeals over and over again and instead of helping everyone individually, I should create some sort of system or website to help people automatically. I approached several tra traffic lawyers in London and asked them what they thought about the idea of a chatbot lawyer. Some were more polite than others, but every single one said it was silly and would never work. <laughs> but thinking it was a cool side project and I could impress my friends, I decided to create it anyway and name the bot Do Not Pay. And I'll show you a brief demo later, but the way it works is it takes down a few details and goes down a decision tree to find an appropriate legal defense for your parking ticket. Once it knows a legal issue, it then takes down a few details and places these details into a legally sound document, which you can then send directly to the local authorities. Now, I really just created this as a side project and could never have imagined that in, uh, in just over a year, do not pay would take the legal world by storm. <laughs> in a year and a half, the bot went viral, successfully appealing over 275,000 parking tickets, saving drivers an estimated $7 million. All of this made me realize that the idea of automated legal services is bigger than just a few parking fines. I decided to expand to other areas of the law. 
I started by going after the airlines. In Europe, if your flight is delayed, as I'm sure you know, you can claim compensation. However, lawyers were charging huge commissions to do this, which I thought was outrageous. So I added the functionality to my robot lawyer to help people claim it for free. It's completely free because it doesn't require anyone to have a look at it or, or get paid with a salary. Unfortunately, users began contacting me, assuming that because I could help with parking and flights, I could help them with everything. <laughs> I began to receive a large number of messages about evictions and repossessions. This felt, this, I kind of felt especially bad because people were being made homeless. I later learned that in the UK we have this broken system. Instead of housing the homeless directly, the government will pay a lawyer huge sums of money to file an application, just basically fill out a form, and then send that application back to the government. This seemed like something that needed to be fixed. So to solve this problem, I worked with Centerpoint, one of the largest homeless charities in the UK, to expand my robot lawyer to automatically claim government housing if you're made homeless. And from this experience and the others, it's clear that so many areas of the law can be automated with chatbots. My chatbot now works in over half a dozen legal areas, including helping UK tenants fight their landlords and those with HIV understand their rights and responsibilities. It's really exciting to announce that in the past few weeks, I expanded to allow refugees to claim asylum in the UK, US, and Canada. It first takes down a few details to ensure that a refugee is eligible for asylum, uh, bas uh, uh, basically uh, like um, that they're being persecuted or um, that they're per being targeted on, um, sorry, excuse me, six uh, factors. Um, once it determines if someone's eligible, it then takes down hundreds of details and populates um, an entire um, basic asylum application, which is not only helpful in claiming asylum, but also in qualifying for legal aid, particularly in the UK. So what does this all mean? Well, there have been two main takeaways from this whole experience. The first is that the government is going to get a much, a much more efficient with the rise of technology. The UK government, for example, is terrible at managing parking spaces and dealing with homelessness, but a chatbot has done a considerable amount to change, change that. In the future, these bots will act as a way to help the most vulnerable get help from the state. Secondly, I know this might not be very popular, but technology and chatbots are actually going to have a big impact on the law. As a 20-year-old, I've been working on my own, and I already know lots of parking ticket lawyers who don't like me. <laughs> I know that there are thousands more programmers with decades more experience than me working on similar issues. So in summary, chatbots have a huge potential in the law. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if a, bot is, if a bot is asking for someone's date of birth to fill out a form or a human is asking. The answer will always be the same. Thank you very much. So hello, my name is Kevin Shu. I am a third year law student here at Stanford Law. Let me just try to build, find my uh, demo, because I'm assuming that's what y'all came here to see. Uh, I'm a third year law student here, so I got a couple more months to go. Uh, and uh, I have been working on this with a team of people to uh, help people better use and understand their health insurance policies. So this is a very much more of a, uh, a US-centric topic. Uh, as many of you know, the healthcare policy in this country can certainly be uh, more simplified. I don't actually know how to use it. Um, I show start from the beginning. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, I have been building a healthcare insurance chatbot to help people better use their health care insurance in this country. So before we talk about the demo itself, I want to kind of lay the groundwork here a little bit in terms of what is the motivating problem here. Uh, consumer literacy in terms of insurance in this country is very low. The, uh, the system is very, very complex. 
Uh, this is not only backed up by a 2014 study done by the Kaiser Family Foundation, but also perhaps anecdotally among all of us, whenever we deal with health insurance, you're like, oh, is this covered? Is this not covered? What does this out-of-pocket uh, cost mean? What does that have to do with my co-insurance? And all this kind of confusion is causing not just dissatisfaction or confusion among consumers, but ultimately high cost. And uh, unfortunately, medical cost is one of the most common causes of bankruptcy in this country. And we really think of this as a lack of access to good information and in a way to justice as well. So how can we unlock that document that is your health care insurance? Uh, and to add a bit more broader context, and sadly, insult to injury, health care in this country is changing, it's volatile, it's unpredictable. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows that uh, the latest effort to repeal and replace Obamacare has failed, but that doesn't mean it's not coming back. The tweets are still coming, uh, and therefore people are rightfully uh, concerned, right, about what is the future with my health care plan? What is the future with my insurance? And will the premium still go up? So people do need really good information in the context of the plan that they have. So we've set out to combine both user-centric design thinking and the latest and the best AI tools, whether it comes to natural language processing or computer vision, to build something that is not just scalable and available to people, but uh, also has a, a human touch to it, because these are real human lives at stake here. Uh, and before I get into the demo, I want to just tell you guys about our team real quick. So uh, there are three of us working on this right now. All the way to the right, you have Alpha Lilstrom. She is based in D.C. She has close to a decade of health policy experience in D.C., mostly in the Senate. She is also a breast cancer survivor. Uh, in the middle, you have Alex. He is based here in the Bay Area with me, former Apple engineer and also a uh, Stanford PhD in electric engineering. And then you have me all the way to the left, still at Stanford Law School for a couple months. Uh, I was a former White House staffer doing policy communications. And I love to do design work. I do a lot of work here with the Legal Design Lab here at the law school. I also work with the Codex folks and a web developer and I love to make bots. Uh, so let me see if I can show you the boss that we've made. Um, it's always pretty risky doing a live demo in front of an audience, so uh, let's see if the demo god is on my side today. All right, I'm sure many of you who've done this will know. So as you can see, it's a very simple chat window in front of you that can be easily embedded in any website, smartphone app, portal, company website, even after you log into your HR department or your health insurance website. And then you fire it up. What you first see when it tells you anything <laughs> would be a quick dashboard of the most, um, I would say the most important two pieces of uh, uh, cost item that you're going to keep track of as a health insurance user, your out-of-pocket and your deductible. But of course, there are other things that we can add into it, for example, HSA or FSA spending tracking. And then the second little panel you see is really uh, I would say the home screen that begins to triage the most common questions that people have. So we've been doing a lot of user testing here locally with young parents, young mother, young father, and we got a good sense of not just the kind of common questions they have, but also emotionally, what do they feel when they actually have health insurance questions? And what we discovered is that people have a hard time articulating what those questions are if you just give them a blank screen to type into. Usually the feeling you get when you're confused, it's just, ugh, somebody help me, right? So these buttons are actually designed in the form of a question specifically to make that experience a little less intimidating and more useful. Uh, so in the interest of time, I won't show everything on here, but I'm happy to do a more comprehensive demo afterwards. But let me just show you the coverage question real quick. So divide this up into three broad categories, medical, mental health, and prescription drug. Uh, and the interface is really straightforward, right? It's very much similar to what uh, Joshua demonstrated. You just type in your question in natural language. So what would my coverage be if I do like a PET scan, for example? And then our system, our AI natural language system will pick this up, I hope, at some point. And, um, you know, maybe not today, not my day. Uh, or it will come eventually. But uh, uh, what would happen is that you actually pull out, here we go, the terms and conditions. It's usually a lot faster on like a different computer. But uh, the terms and conditions that's actually in specifically your plan. So in this case, we've understood in a way that you're talking about pet imaging. 
we pulled the terms out of the plan for you. And just for your context, this is based on a real plan used by Apple, one of the PPO savings plan that we've used to just do this demo and test out our data structure on the back. And you can imagine this thing parsing out really any number of health plans uh, that are out there to answer questions specifically related to your uh, health plan. And uh, some of the natural next question that people have is, OK, so now that you found uh, the coverage, I want to find an in-network provider. right? That's something you would ideally like to use to save the most money. So if you want our system to help you do that, we can look through a directory of your network providers, pull out a relevant map, something that's closest to you with a phone number that you can call to make an appointment. So that is what I will show you today. But again, happy to do more uh, offline. And let's get back to my presentation real quick. So as you can see, the current thing that we've shown you is really designed for a broad range of audience. And what we've uh, discovered is, that, of course, health is a very individualistic experience. So we're actually in the process of uh, focusing in on a very specific target audience. Uh, we're starting out with young breast cancer patients, young women who are under 40, just got diagnosed, and people who really need ongoing support and information and assistance uh, about their insurance, about their cost, as they navigate throughout their treatment and the services they need. And of course, you can imagine this being expanded to many other types of use cases, whether it's more cancer patients or other patients with chronic conditions. Uh, so we have, we'll have more to announce on that front in the coming weeks uh, to release either more beta products or more user testing. So if you're interested, happy to stay in touch, either via Twitter or via the non-Twitter way, whatever you feel comfortable with. All right, thank you. Before we start our demo, let, let us uh, share you about who we are. Uh, we come from Russia, where we uh, created the most successful uh, legal marketplace in the country, and we sold it. It was named uh, Startup of the Year in 2016 by Forbes Russia. And when we sold it, we uh, decided to move to California. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are now, and as you may guess, we experienced huge immigration issues here. Uh, so we decided to uh, create some tool that would help uh, us and guys like us solve these matters easier than uh, they are solved right now. So we created VisaBot. Yeah, uh, my name is Artem, and actually I'm very happy. I don't need to explain what bot is, finally. Thank you, Joshua. Um, so a little bit about VisaBot. We are part of 500 startups, Boost VC, and LexisNexis acceleration program. Uh, since November 2016, we have more than 50,000 users. And yeah, you can. Uh, so uh, we probably will not talk much about how chatbots important. Uh, we will just show you what our chatbot can already do, and probably share our plans for the future. So uh, since we're at Stanford now, uh, among of many immigration services that are in, in place right now. We uh, decided to show you, uh, to, to give you the example of OPT. Uh, this is a set of documents that uh, students should file with USCIS if they want to get their first job. Um, and it's pain for many of them, so we decided to simplify the whole thing. Uh, since we're a Facebook Messenger chatbot, uh, we, um, we, can, we have access to their profiles and we pull all the data about the first name, last name, and other details. So uh, people do not, do not need to do, uh, to do that much typing. We do it for them. Uh, also, we uh, work a lot on natural language processing so that uh, any, uh, any question should, uh, could be easily understood. And this is actually what uh, users value much because then they start playing with the bot, asking questions. Uh, and this is something that uh, really differentiates chatbots from web-based solutions and makes it more fun. Uh, people make mistakes. VisaBot tries to eliminate those mistakes. Uh, so here we have an example where people uh, make a mistake in th their, their uh, social security number and uh, the bot suggests that uh, this mistake should be corrected. And as you may know, uh, the, the problem with the form filling thing is that uh, you have to be very attentive. Uh, we strive uh, to make a solution that uh, will let people relax to some extent and uh, so that the chatbot could take the hardest part. 
Uh, and another hard thing that we're trying to uh, solve uh, is making tailor-made applications. Uh, it's really tricky because uh, even in such simple thing as OPT, you have many variables, and one of them is, uh, here is the example, is about the uh, residential zip code of the user. So depending on that zip code, you have uh, different options where your applications, uh, application will be filed. Uh, so uh, depending on that factor, our chatbot suggests different USCIS uh, offices uh, across the country. Uh, yeah, and we're coming to, to the final and the sweetest part. After the user um, answer, answers simple questions, uh, he or she gets the full package of documents, including the fully generated cover letters. Uh, and the only thing uh, the user needs to do is uh, to print it all out, uh, sign, and file with the USCIS. So this is the part which already works, and uh, we believe that some people enjoy it. And Artem will now tell about uh, our vision and how we see really the future of uh, AI uh, in our company. And um, yeah, so we work with many uh, immigration lawyers, and what we discover is that 80% of their work is a routine work. It's emailing with clients, uh, receiving information. Sorry for that. Um, okay, no work. And we decided that the bots, so that we can build a bot for a lawyer and he can do all this, uh, it can do all this routine work. So what it can do for now, it can use different channels of communication with the client. So let's say the client send you an email or it send you a message on Slack, Facebook or SMS, whatever. It can communicate with the client without even lawyer involved and schedule an appointment or a consultation. Uh, then it can do invoicing, so it can send uh, the, the bill and then to alert the client that he needs to pay it uh, to, the, to the special date. Uh, then the bot knows what type of documents it should ask uh, the client, so for different types of visas. Uh, and the most interesting part that after the bot collected all the documents, it can also fill uh, the forms taking the information from these documents. And in the end, uh, a lawyer will receive uh, the whole application ready and just review it. Uh, right now we're work working with a couple of immigration law firms, but uh, we still have a couple of places for closed beta. So if you're interested to try it out, please send us an email. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Joshua Lennon. I am the lawyer in residence at Clio. I can be reached on Twitter at Joshua Lennon. I am a fan of technology, as you can tell. And I firmly believe that we are about to enter what I call a reign of tech terror when it comes to chatbots, despite the fabulous demos that we've seen already. So what do I know about chatbots? Well, one, I use the same technology that everybody else here does as well. But back when the first travel ban was enacted by the Trump administration, I was actually a minor part of a great team of lawyers that over the course of the week weekend built Airport Lawyer, which was a website that helped people from various countries determine if they may have a legal issue in traveling to the United States. And if they so elected, pass their information off to groups of volunteer lawyers who were at the airports standing by. And it met a need for these travelers in terms of knowing that there was somebody on the other side waiting to fight for their rights. And it helped these lawyers because they had no means of knowing if there was someone within the customs area that needed their help. They were literally asking people as they exited the terminal, is there somebody left behind? Do you know their name? Do you know what country they came from? So we built a site that connected them together. And I thought it was a great site, and I'm very proud of the work that I did on that. And it full credit goes to the team that did the majority of the work of that. I was just one small cog in that wheel. But simply because we have 
one, two, three instances of technology that may be very, very helpful does not mean that chatbots as a whole are a panacea when it comes to the legal space. People worry that computers are going to become smart and take over the world. And the truth is that computers are very stupid and they've already taken over the world. <laughs> this is Pedro Domingos from the Master Algorithm. And it actually, I think, demonstrates where we are now when it comes to public-facing legal technology. My thesis is that, unfortunately, the public cannot tell good legal technology from bad legal technology, and there is way more bad than good out there. Why are chatbots grabbing so much attention? It is because courts are incredibly expensive. If we take a look at the administrative office for the courts of California, we see that in 2016, California budgeted about $4 billion to the operation of their court system. That's about $95 per Californian for the operation of it. About three out of every $4 went to, went to operating the trial system within California. And this was less than 1.5% of the entire California budget was spent on the administration of justice. Thankfully, 25 million of that had been budgeted for a court innovation program, and I want you to keep that number in mind, 25 million, and know that the Access to Justice Gap Fund in California estimates that there are at least six million people in California not being served, not having their justice needs met, even though we're spending close to $4 billion in this state. Courts are expensive. Chatbots are cheap. So the average chatbot is estimated to cost between five to $10,000 to create. And to maintain them, they are actually even cheaper. So if you're using a platform like Amazon Lex, so this is a dedicated platform for chat that also functions with both speech and text technology, you can get about 1,000 speech interactions for $4 and 1,000 text interactions for about 75 cents. Most chatbots costs, once they're launched, are about $19 a month. They are ridiculously cheap, and they are becoming incredibly prevalent. We know that they have, according to Jatbot Magazine, which apparently is a real thing, <laughs> uh, raised at least $170 million in reported venture capital funding uh, in less than eight months in 2016. $170 million for chatbots, 25 million for court innovation in California. Guess how many chatbots we're gonna end up with? A lot. We do know that since Facebook opened up their messaging platform to chatbots, that over 34,000 chatbots developed by 33,000 different developers have gone live on their platform. Now, are they all legal chatbots? No. Uh, there are some really actually interesting ones out there, like Poncho is a great example. You chat, hey, Poncho, do I need a poncho today? And it looks at the weather report for your area and says, yes, you need a poncho. It's going to rain. So admittedly, that one probably didn't cost $10,000 to create, but it's probably having way more interactions than a lot of the legal chatbots that are out there. Oh. Oh. And what we're finding, unfortunately, is that legal chatbots can unintentionally deny people's rights. And I think this is very important, and it goes back to my thesis, in that when the public interacts with legal technology, they can't tell a good outcome from a bad outcome other than kind of a personal desired outcome. So we know from Rebecca Sandifer's research on a city in Illinois that very, very few people actually recognize that they have a legal problem. But when they do, and that's about 15% of the people who were in that survey, they were asked, why don't you ask a lawyer about getting a solution to that? And as you can see, almost 50% of those people said that they had no need for advice. They knew what they were doing. And why do they know what they are doing? Because they turned to Google. Now remember, chatbots are really cheap to create. Chatbots are really cheap to operate. So the majority of the budget spent by chatbot companies is on public awareness. It's on marketing. It's on becoming that first answer at the top of Google. So when we look at this question, how do I stop from getting evicted? The first answer put up by Google is actually from a site called moneycrashers.com. How many people think a lawyer runs that site? <laughs> uh, not many. One of my favorite examples of this is howtotakesomeone2court.com, 
And on the very first line, disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. And yet, hundreds of thousands of people go to this exact site every year. The public cannot tell good legal advice from bad legal advice. And because of the proliferation of chatbots, these team notwithstanding, we are going to see a proliferation of bad legal advice. And I think there are a couple reasons why chatbots will be giving bad legal advice. And the reason they are is that they fail to address three key factors when it comes to providing legal advice. Geography, choices and consequences, and evidence. Now some of these are endemic to the platform itself, the verbal back and forth nature of chatbots, and some of these are endemic in their design. So importantly, when it comes to geography, legal rights are very geographically restricted. Your rights change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, from state to state, from country to country. Chatbots on the internet are global. And so we see lots of people interacting with chatbots in a way that may not necessarily meet their needs, even though they think they've found legal help. So this is a screenshot provided by Ken Pope. You may know him as the blogger Pope Hat. When he reviewed Lawbot, which is a bot being produced in uh, Oxford, England by law students there, focusing on criminal needs. So if you have a problem with a crime, they may be able to provide some type of legal advice. And so for those in the back who may not be able to read this, the Lawbot has offered the person to help contact the police on their criminal query. At which point the person said, yes, I need to contact the police in Los Angeles, California. At which point the bot said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know where that is. What? If you follow this example on Pope Hat's blog, you see that this is actually the last question in a series of 20 some odd questions that have been asked about this person who was giving very intimate details about an assault that may have been perpetrated on them. Why was this not the first question asked? Where are you? Bots that ignore geography, bots that ignore inherent technology that is part of the internet that can help identify geographical locations may be doing a disservice and giving bad legal advice as a part of their functionality. When it comes to choices and consequences, the back and forth textual or verbal nature of chatbots may also be doing a disservice in the legal advice that they are giving. So it's very difficult to go backwards in a chatbot. You're very much kind of following a linear path flow in a flow chart, right? These are expert systems, as Michael Mills would like to call them. So it means that it's very difficult for you to go back and change your answer and see how that would impact your claim. How many, I'm gonna show my age, how many people did the choose your own adventure books, right? You get to a page, it gives you choose A, go to page 89, or choose B, go to page 122. And if you were like me, you would stick your finger in that spot and turn to both locations and see what the outcome was, right? It's difficult to stick your finger in a chatbot. No. So fortunately, there are other technologies that may provide the same level of access to justice without necessarily removing the idea of choices and consequences. And here's an example that I put up from Stanford's own Margaret Hagen, where she takes a look at a parking ticket, same simple questions that are being put forth by uh, tools like Josh Browder's, but you're able to see by choosing yes or no how the answer changes on the far right side of that screen. So I know the consequences of my declarations. And that's an important interactive feature that a chatbot may not be able to provide. It's definitely very difficult to program. And I'd be curious to see how our panelists are tackling this. The last bit where chatbots fail is evidence. This screen is blank for a reason. If, for example, you're doing something like VisaBot and you get all the way through and they say, you know what, you, you probably actually don't have an immigration claim here. That's it, you can be done. The example they showed had great documents that were already populated and downloadable. They didn't show you the people who didn't get any documents. And what do those people do if VisaBot is wrong? What will Hibbert do if it gives the wrong medical advice based on insurance? Does everybody here save every message they get on their phone? Because that's what we're going to be asking people to do to prove that the consequences of their choices, which may be bad legal advice, have impacted their life. 
So I'd like to give one example, and I'm gonna put one of my panelists on the spot. So Josh, sorry. So one of the services that he mentioned was the fact that you can give HIV notifications. So I, this is a screenshot. Um, it's actually one single column, but I've blown up a portion of it so you can see the actual functionality. And with this, you can actually text a person that you are HIV positive. If they interact with the chat bot that is triggered by that text, acknowledging that they have received it, you will receive a notification via email that they have been notified. And my understanding is this will also be pushed as a record onto a blockchain. Now, I don't know which blockchain, and I wasn't able to actually get the specific message Bitcoin. to trigger in my testing. Sorry, Sorry? Bitcoin it's, blockchain. It's a Bitcoin blockchain? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So there are a couple issues here. For example, will this text every country out there? There are 70 countries that have criminalization of HIV laws, some of which are very strict. There are 30 states in the US that have criminalization of HIV transmission laws. Can I text any of those? Or is this UK specific? What is the notification message that, my pers that the person I'm notifying receives? Does it rise to the level of adequacy within the jurisdiction that I'm informing them on? What information specifically is being stored on the blockchain? And is Bitcoin HIPAA compliant when it comes to sensitive medical information? Is Bitcoin compliant when it comes to the EU privacy directives? All of these are legal questions that while we have a great tool here that is providing the basis of a legal need, may not be a full and adequate legal representation experience. And so, while I think chatbots, as we've seen, are really good at providing triage, they may not necessarily be the panacea for access to justice, that they've been made out to be in popular media. And there's one thing that every one of these chatbots could include that would make them better. And that is, would you like to talk to a lawyer now? Thank you very much. Uh, so we want to open up the discussion in just a, a moment, but um, uh, Joshua's laid a lot uh, out there that some of the panelists may want to respond, and if I could uh, just try to crystallize, <laughs> um, uh, uh, try to crystallize this into a particular um, metric to think about. How do you think about, how do you design, how do you manage your chatbots for the possibility of the risk of legal error? So one aspect of that is how you bake, how you work legal interpretation into the code and what kinds of choices you make and what kinds of legal decision making may be involved in that. The other piece of it is how you inform users of either alternatives, you could have a lawyer, uh, you could consult another chatbot, you could go to other resources, or how you inform them about the possibility or limitations of the chatbot itself, if you do so. So there are kind of two questions that I think crystallize some of the issues that Joshua's raised. Um, and I don't have any particular uh, order, but I want to keep things brief because we've got about uh, uh, 15 minutes. I want to get a few questions in. So if you have a brief response. So um, throughout um, the more serious chatbots, for example, homelessness, refugees, um, I actually provide escalation procedures to charities who I've partnered with. So I mentioned earlier with my homelessness bot, I'm partnering with Centerpoint. And so if my bot th says that your case is too complicated, it doesn't just like leave you hanging. It, refers you to center point so that you can get human help that you need. And I think any chat, any legal chatbot without proper escalation procedures is actually quite irresponsible. So my bot is completely free. It escalates if it thinks your claim is too complicated. And it also says, you know, if you don't understand the forms or if you're not comfortable in any way, see a lawyer, get it checked over. So I'm trying to de-risk the situation as much as possible so that we don't have the kind of technical doomsday that was said in the last presentation. <laughs> are, are, are those disclaimers at the, at the front end? Um, the escalation procedures would occur at the end of the user using the chatbot, but are the other things that you mentioned, are they at the front end, what they confront uh, uh, when they initially begin working with the program? Yes, so it's mentioned throughout. It's, um, and not only that, there are actually links. So when it asks you a question, it also gives you links. So for example, one of the questions for homelessness is, have you been a vic victim of domestic violence? And is that why you're homeless? And if you say yes to that, then not only will it continue with your application, it also gives you specific help to the charity helping with domestic violence, homelessness. And how did it occur to you to raise that question? So I was working with lawyers and um, the charity center point, and that's why. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Right, and in terms of the health insurance context, so number one, we definitely do not get into anything that's even close to becoming medical advice, since uh, none of the you know team or any of the technology is suited for that. Uh, in the context of just helping people understand the terms of your insurance policy, we also have a uh, sort of a way to integrate more human specialists into the back end as well when the edge cases do come up, when the question does become too complicated for the AI to parse out, that it can be seamlessly transitioned to, say, your health insurance company's uh, you know, human specialist or your company's uh, HR specialist, for example. We never really envision this as something that will do 100% of all the questions, but even if we can get 50, 60% of the stuff out of the way, so you don't have to budget 45 minutes of your working day to call a health insurance company, which is uh, sadly the norm, or if something happens on a weekend or on a weekday night, say, you know, a young mother's kid went to soccer practice and, you know, got into an injury, that you can talk to this thing to get a baseline and prepare yourself for what is ahead. Uh, that that is still, I think, a lot of a value added to the user. So, so can, and, I, just, can yeah. I just follow up right there on that point? So I, I think you're right about the medical advice question, but you're also intermediating in a contractual relationship mm -hmm. between the insurance provider and the, um, uh, the person who actually holds the policy. So how, do you, how would you distinguish how your chatbot operates from, say, a health insurance provider designing a chatbot to do almost exactly the same thing, but tilting it a little bit in, uh, against the uh, customer realizing that they may have a breach of contract claim. Mm -hmm. By designing the chatbot to essentially mediate what would otherwise be, what, what might otherwise become a breach of contract claim. Right, right. Well, I mean, I think that's a really difficult question that resides in not just the legal implication, but the entire healthcare system in the United States and how all those different pieces work. And uh, you know, right now, since it is a consumer-facing tool, we want the consumers to have as much good information as possible. So in a way, you can kind of advocate for yourself, but uh, you know, the terms are terms, right? So there are a lot of interpretation issues that we are, of course, working uh, into uh, the technology. Anything quickly from VisaBot? Yeah, uh, like before I jump to all these disclaimers we have in our bots and uh, the way we position ourselves as a bot um, with other users, I just want to uh, just to state that I really believe that the advantage the chatbots have uh, uh, outweighed the problems that may be connected to all those legal issues. Uh, and I would like to give the example that we did, that we did not um, talk about, but something that we already developed. Uh, it's a, a DACA program, so you may know uh, that many people um, have come to the United States as children and they were undocumented and under Trump administration, they run a high risk of being deported. And there are three mil million of such people, so we made a software for them, uh, and they, uh, that's how they ha have no, um, their normally very poor and they do not have access, uh, they do not have money for lawyers. So uh, we made a product for them which uh, helped thousands of them um, have all their forms filled. Uh, and probably, um, Joshua, you're right that th there might be some concerns. And we're trying to minimize uh, all those issues that you, that you mentioned. But, uh, we believe that uh, the benefit that chatbots may bring in that way really outweighs the, the downside. So speaking about the technical things, uh, like come, coming to the question, um, we always encourage people, uh, uh, first of all, uh, if we are not 100% sure that a person is eligible for something, uh, we would not let the person use the bot. Um, and we have a lot of filters for that. And uh, we also encourage all people to address a lawyer if there is any complexity in, 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 the, in, in the background of a person. So, of course, uh, we and many other chatbots try to minimize any risk of being held responsible for legal advice by, uh, by stating that we only uh, give some technical support in a preparing document, uh, some technical support in filling out the forms. Great. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, and there is not much uh, 
not many uh, precedents uh, in courts on that uh, because, as you may uh, know, the, the whole issue is very new. Uh, and I'm sure there will be problems. Um, there are actually only 20 uh, citation references to chatbots on Westlaw. I checked on yeah, Tuesday, yeah. so it's very, we've got a couple of people who want to get questions in and we're short on time, so let me invite uh, the question yeah. there from the... So hi everyone, I'm Margaret. Um, Yay. Hi. <laughs> so I'd like to echo, I think, what Kevin and Josh made allusion to, which is looking at the bots from the user's perspective. And when we do studies of how people are actually using tools like this, think of it as at their kitchen table with paper spread out in front of them, trying to figure out how to answer that question correctly, whether it's about asylum, about family law, about eviction, about visas. So I think the challenge with chatbots is figuring out exactly that, what the specific functions they're actually good at, whether it's just triage or form filling, and being really specific about what type of panacea it is, because there's potential here, we should harness it, but we shouldn't expect too much of it. And the other thing is how we get chatbots to give a more systematic mental model of what the heck is going on. Because people are overwhelmed, they can answer questions, but they still don't understand exactly what is going on. They just get brought down that funnel by the chatbot, but they don't know what's happening to them, and they're not becoming a smarter legal consumer oftentimes. They want some kind of map or overview or, the screen is small, we know that's kind of the value of the chatbot, but I'd like to hear any thoughts you have about how to give people some empowerment along with the funnel that you're taking them down. Let me take a couple more comments and then we can hear from the panel, or a couple more questions or comments. So, mm -hmm. sir, did you have a? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I sort of want to hear the answer to that one, but I want the panel to have a couple to respond to rather yeah, than say okay. have to go down gotcha. the chain of the panel all on one question and we'll gotcha. be out of so, time. So, so mine is sort of complementary at the other end, which is that there's mo this is model of legal advice uh, uh, giving which is based on um, an explicit logical representation of legal rules uh, and applying an inference process to that, and there's, there's there are very well studied and understood advantages to that. For example, you can get a justification, you can verify the, the, that you've represented the rules the right way, you can update it easily because you can swap out the rules. Um, once the, the general framework is uh, uh, s sort of amenable to other, you know, multiple kinds of applications because you can just take the logic and, and remove it and so forth. And so my question is, um, uh, so there are many advantages over, over sort of having a, a kind of ad hoc, purely uh, sort of interface-based approach or decision tree-based approach. I'll give you another advantage of the logical model is it doesn't ask you relevant questions. So, um, so I guess my question is whether any of these bot models make use of an explicit logical representation of the underlying legal rules. Good. So anyone first on the tunnel vision problem? Um, I can start. <laughs> um, so in terms of the health insurance and the health cost side of things, I think you're totally right, Margaret, that there's a lot more moving pieces than to the question that is in front of you right now or the prompt that you're seeing right now. And the one thing we're actually trying out is to represent a lot of these information in a more visual way. The one you're seeing is not that visual. The one that we are uh, designing for uh, young breast cancer patients, for example, is a much more visual because of the type of treatment they have to go through, the timeline that they have to go through, and kind of give you a better overview uh, of that information. So uh, there are a lot of different design techniques that we are trying out to make that work better for our user, but you know, to emphasize the user, I think it's really important. We always start with the problem with the people, not really the bot. The bot is a way to deliver information very quickly. Um, you know, the bot concept isn't even that new. I think the very first chat bot was Eliza. It was conceived in the 60s by the good folks over at MIT. So, you know, it's not something that we came up with two years ago. But, uh, you know, with all the user behavior with texting and the mobile application, all that kind of stuff, we do see a room for chat bot to really intervene in that regard. But other things are obviously things that we're testing as well. And then on logical inference, does anyone want to jump in there? Sure, I can. So um, one of the areas where a decision tree was really useful was for parking tickets. Um, there are only probably 25 defenses that cover probably 80% of the cases. And so in that case, if you just have a decision tree, one answer can eliminate a lot of possibilities. I think the million dollar question is, why does everyone want to do chatbots in the law rather than um, websites or apps? 
And I think this goes back to the first question that someone asked, in that people are really surprisingly inarticulate at describing their legal issue. If they have a website with 10 options um, for parking tickets, for example, describe your defense, and there are 10 options there, even though one of the options that may apply to them, they don't pick it. So a chatbot can help transfer um, what people say into the legally correct defense, rather than having people have to pick and understand more than they should. And so in terms of designing a good chatbot, you have to make it really simple to understand, which I think lawyers aren't so good at, because a lot of the legal websites um, <laughs> just have lots of jargon, which is unfortunate, because there's a problem of maybe you know, giving incorrect advice, and that's an important issue. But another problem is accessibility. You need to make sure people can actually use the products. Yeah, over here. Good design. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, here, you were in front line first. Go ahead. Yeah. Actually, I'd love to ask my question now because I think that's such a great observation about... I'm sorry, could you step up to the mic a little bit, please? Sure. I think what Josh just said about why chatbots are more effective at getting users to communicate their, their legal problems is a really great observation. But I think on the flip side, the possible harm that a chatbot could do is that much greater because you are interpreting the way the user is interacting with your set of questions rather than making the user do some work in interpreting like what the landscape is. So my question is really a question about how a chatbot should position itself in the market in terms of, um, I guess, being super clear about what it is doing, what it's not doing, and what the user's responsibilities are in interacting with it. And my specific observation is that, and forgive me if I'm misstating this, but I looked at, I think it's Robo Lawyer for the asylum applicants, and um, it seems to like literally be saying it's legal advice. And even the, the term Robo Lawyer, right, implies that what's happening here is legal advice. And from my perspective, that seems like a lot to be saying about the interaction between a technology and somebody who's trying to get to a legal benefit. Um, and then just a, another remark is just that how do you deal, especially in a free application, with, um, with superficial users who basically are just trying to manipulate a technology to get to a result? Um, I mean, you know, in the US, and I think the UK as well, there are legal benefits you get just from um, filing the asylum application. Yeah. So there seems like there's a lot of opportunity there for abuse, and I would be interested to know what your comments are on that. Can I jump in on that one? Yeah, now? please. So uh, I do think the issue of abuse is important, but I think we may be looking at it from the wrong end. And so if we take a look at VisaBot, uh, they use the example of helping 50,000 users, right? And on the, the screen demo that they gave you, they were able to collect some really interesting information like alien number, social security number, things like that. And they cited the 50,000 people as a positive. But if we look at Josh's point of the chatbot as being something where people are much more likely to disclose and share information, there could be 50,000 people giving that same information to a fake visa bot right now. And so the idea that the medium makes them more likely to, to disclose should be a bit terrifying and not necessarily encouraging in this instance. Can I just ask one question very quickly, and we've got to um, close. What about the, how do you handle confidentiality? I mean, your hypothetical is that some other chatbot, somebody might go to another chatbot and disclose the information that's used for criminal purposes. Um, but how do you handle, do you make representations about what will be done with the information that uh, users provide to your chatbots? So Josh does, in the example that I provided, if you want to talk about that yeah. with the HIV disclosure? So um, I, let me just start by saying that for um, the refugee chatbot and the homelessness, homelessness chatbot, the data is destroyed immediately. For the, um, refi for the HIV chatbot, um, what it does is it proves the disclosure on the blockchain without having any specifics. So, you, so it's very cryptographically complicated, but basically you have an email with a key that proves that you're related to this disclosure, but in the blockchain it's just an anonymous disclosure that nobody knows. So you're the only one with the information, but you still have the ability to prove in the courts that this is you and you've made the disclosure and you shouldn't go to jail unfairly. So that's actually the beauty of technology. It can actually manage the really serious privacy issues so that everyone wins. 
On that beautiful note, we're going to um, finish so we can start the next panel. <laughs> Thank you very much.